Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to chapel. Couple of critical, cool things are going on today. First of all, happy birthday to Chloe Smith. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Is it anyone else's birthday today, by the way? Oh, we got over here, Sam Nunha. Happy birthday to you as well, Sam. We're not gonna sing, because we just gotta save our voices. Is that okay? All right. Hey, really, really good uh, praise the Lord news this morning. Um, we welcome to the world, last night at 10.09 p.m., Quentin Gabriel Baima joined us. Seven pounds, yeah. Seven pounds, five ounces, for those of you who need to know, 20 inches long, mom and dad, mom and baby are doing very well. Jake, Mr. Bima said, dad is tired. Would you guys like to see a picture? There you go. All right. So, if you're looking for Mr. Bima the next couple days, he's going to be just celebrating, enjoying uh, Gabriel with his wife, so just thank the Lord for that. Um, tomorrow, uh, I want to talk a little bit about tomorrow. Uh, at noon tomorrow, we're going to have a groundbreaking ceremony for the 21 campaign. And for lunch tomorrow, we're going to do something different. Um, we're going to have what's called a running lunch freshman, where you will be sent to the gym. We'll all be eating in the gym. We've got multiple food lines. It should go pretty fast. But you're going to have lunch in the gym tomorrow because this place will start to fill up with guests before, so while you're having lunch, this, this place will start to fill up. When the bell rings at 11.57, you guys as students will come into this place and we'll have our guests down here and we're just gonna ask you to find a seat to kind of fill in around them. Maybe up there, preferably, because it's so full down here, but if there's open seats down here, you can sit down here as well. So we're just gonna come in here. Uh, tomorrow's got a little bit of a chapel feel. It's a little history thing on Unity. It's a celebration of what uh, has happened so far for the 21 campaign. And then um, we're going to go outside and we're going to have a groundbreaking photo. And we're going to sing a song. Pastor Tim Breen's going to say a prayer. That's going to happen outside. So lunch, when the bell rings, come in here, find a seat wherever you can. Then groundbreaking outside. Then you'll go to class and we'll be serving cookies and water to our guests. And then whatever cookies and water do not get consumed by our guests, we'll have those out for afternoon break. Okay? I think we're making like four or 500 cookies. There's a good chance there's cookies left, but we aren't sure of how many guests are coming. So that's tomorrow, okay? So kind of a weird week. Normally we don't have chapel on Wednesday. This is usually our living group spot, and on next Wednesday you will go to your first living group of the year and your location, and you're, you'll all be invited, okay, if you're not sure where to go you'll have an invitation from your living group leaders on Monday. So that's a little bit about what's going on tomorrow. Our speaker today is Mr. Cade Groeschel. He's graduate of Unity, class of, I wrote it down, 2017, I wrote down 20, thank you. I wrote down 2021, I'm like, that is not right. That's this year. So class of 2017, uh, was a great student here at Unity, and uh, he is a graduate now of Dort College and is just serving the Lord in ministry, and he's here to, to share uh, a word with you from God's word, and join me in welcoming Kate Rochelle. To so stand real quick, this is how we're going to start. Yeah, I'm already making you do something you don't want to do, trust me. I just want you to close your hands, close your eyes and lift your hands up in the air. Don't worry, all of your eyes is closed, you don't have to worry about anyone looking at you. And this is how we're going to pray. This is a posture of surrender, elevating the Lord, knowing who he is. And so let's, let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this time that we get to gather together in this place. 
Lord, I thank you that we don't have to have the expectation that this will be the same chapel as every other one or that this will be the same day as every other day. But Father, we can come before you every single day, every time we open our eyes, every time we look to your word and see that you're about to do a new thing. That you're the same God, but you care just as deeply about us as every single person in this room, no matter what situation they are in life. Lord, we come before you expectant of receiving something today that we can take into our life. We come before you expectant of a God of miracles, of a God who what he does in one, he'll do in me. So everyone at the same time, say amen. And you may be seated. That was a good exercise. You know, it's so crazy coming back to your old school. I was telling uh, Mr. Dexter this. I'm going to refer to all the teachers by their last name. Because, you know, when you come back to your old school, you have this, like, internal battle that you come in, and you're like, am I supposed to call you Wayne or Mr. Dykstra? You know, you're like, Mr. Wayne, and it just doesn't flow very well. And so I called him Mr. Dykstra, and you come back in, and I remember thinking back to the fact of how I used to sit, lady with the white jacket right there, sweatshirt, I used to sit right there. Super awkward that I'm calling you out. I'm sorry for making you feel uncomfortable. I used to sit right there when this first came to be. And actually, I sat in that row two years in a row. And when I sat there, I remember thinking to myself, man, I love the fact that we have this night center. I love the fact that we take two times, two chapels every week to gather together and actually hear from the Lord. But the reality is, is when I sat there, I also thought about a couple other things. I thought, Lord, because every, every single person in here has an internal, internal life going on a life for themselves. Every single person in here has a story. Every single person in here has a personal experience that they're going through. And I remember sitting there in that chair thinking to myself, wow, you know what, Lord? I I just wish, just like you used to do in the Old Testament, right? When your hand appeared, I literally pictured it on this back screen right here. When your hand appeared and you wrote on the wall, because I'd look around and i see, Lord, I, I don't know if it's just me. I don't know what's going on. But I feel like if you're the God of miracles, if you're the God of the Bible, if you're the God, the same God that would do all these things that I know you are and I know you do, then why don't I experience those types of things? I hear of stories of people getting miraculously healed by God. I hear of stories of, of crazy spiritual encounters. I hear of stories of, of people like my grandma or my grandpa that got healed, but my grandpa did not. I hear of great things, and I, I'm looking around, and I haven't experienced those things either. This is me sitting in the chair right there. I haven't experienced those things either, and I look around, and I feel like the posture of this room, the atmosphere of this room would be different if we experience the God of the Bible. And, and that, that was super deep for me. It was a profound thought for a 16-year-old. Because <laughs> I have a lot of great memories here. I have a lot of great memories here. I'll tell you one, for starters. I was talking to Mr. Dexter before this, and he said that the, cl- um, the pathway to leadership class is still going. Wait, raise your hand if you're in that class, the leadership class. Oh, everybody up there. I took that class when it first started, and it was awesome because there was like six people, seven people maybe, and uh, I was the only guy, let that sink in, for a whole semester I was the only guy to the pathway to leadership class, but what was incredible was um, when I was in high school, there was these, (laughs) this is such a high school thing, it's going to sound like it's from a movie, there was these five ladies that we all referred to as the fabulous five. And uh, (laughs) they were all in that class as well. So I felt pretty good about myself. You know, I got to spend time with the Fabulous Five uh, four days in a row, and it was just an awesome time. And so there's a lot of of good memories from this place. I remember standing here, and (laughs) I remember taking, meeting Ms. Van Dyke for the first time. I didn't tell you I was going to do this, Ms. Van Dyke. I remember meeting Ms. Van Dyke for the first time, and all I remembered was my sister, Ellie, looking at me and saying, okay, so you're going to meet someone called Ms. Van Dyke. I was like, okay, yeah. You're going to meet someone called Ms. Van Dyke, and as a freshman, she's, it's going to seem like it's very standoffish, you know? She'll keep you at a distance. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. But when you're a senior, she'll become your best friend. I was like, awesome. 
Okay, sounds good. And that is exactly what I experienced. It was the most amazing thing. I met Ms. Van Dyke, and I didn't, I didn't know how to read her at first. But by the end of my senior year, she was someone that supported me in so many different ways. Matter of fact, while I'm up here, I feel like she's taking notes, judging how I'm speeching and everything I'm doing right now. And there's so many other teachers. All these teachers in here, whether you believe it or not, are impacting your life in one way or the other. All these teachers in here, even if you disagree, even if there are times that you don't like coming to the school, you're getting impacted one way or the other. And for me, I can tell you right now, as someone who literally went to the school, not a lot has changed. It's about to change a whole lot. But as someone who came to this school, I can tell you right now that you'll remember the ways that people of this place, the way they impacted you more than the days that seemed to be a little bit worse than the others. And this is all going to a certain point. I remember also having my bad days. I grew up as somebody who placed their identity in my ability to help and lead people. And so every time, every chance that I had, I'd be sitting in the same chair as you, but I'd be concerned about the person next to me and asking myself, how can you help that individual? How could you change their life? And that was really good up until your quality of life becomes so bad that you don't actually know how to help people or you can't help people because everyone knows your situation. And so, on one hand, I had a passionate relationship with Jesus. On one hand, I'd read his word. Guys, this word isn't just some words in a Bible. These words are alive and active. When you read these, you're reading the promises of God to you. When it says that my, my word is like a light unto your path, a lamp unto your feet, that means no matter where you go, when you don't understand where you're going, his word, he will light the path. And the revelation of that, the revelation that this word will change things is the only reason I started to read it. Because if you don't have that revelation that this word, his word, will change your life, there's no reason to read it. Yeah, you can tell yourself, well, I'm just going to read it because I'm gonna, it's going to help me to get to know God, all that, great. But if you get to know God without allowing it to change your life, there's no reason to read it. And what's amazing is I was sitting in those chairs and at the same time as having all these impactful life experiences, at the same time as wanting to help other people, at the same time as having a relationship with Jesus, I made a mistake while I was in high school. My senior year, after spending four years building up this strong foundation, an identity, almost like a facade of who I was. Oh, he's strong. He's good. He's, he's, you know what? He's got it all together. I spent four years building that together, and it was one mistake that took away from me personally. My senior year. I had a relationship with Jesus, and the issue that happened is when I stumbled, when I fell into that sin, when I actually committed that way, and I fell in my senior year, it didn't matter if you knew or not, because I knew, and because my identity was sold, not on the word, but on my ability to help people, I fell apart. There was no firm foundation because I didn't allow my firm foundation to be settled on anything other than my own ability. And this might sound like a, a rebuke, but I'm just telling my story. I have no idea where you guys are. I'm just telling about where I was when I was sitting in that chair, just like you are right now. All the thoughts, all the different things happening in my life. For you, maybe it's right now. Your identity is on the fact that, you know what? I actually don't have more than 16 verses memorized in this Bible. I actually don't know who God says I am. My ability is my ability to actually perform in sports and band because we got a rock and band program. In music, in theater. And for me, that's what happened. When everything else crumbled, all I had was the word. And I remember crying in that parking lot, actually. Yo, dude, this is personal, bro. <laughs> I remember crying. And I just remember thinking to the Lord, God, I, I don't know if I can actually move on. I, I don't know if I can actually do this because I feel like everything I worked for, everything I was, everything that I wanted to be was taken away in that moment because I chose to do that. And I don't know where to go. And I remember opening up my word into Isaiah. And it said, even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord 
will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And I looked at that, and I said, God, if you're the God of miracles, if you're the God of the Bible, then what you did in one, you'll do in me too. Wouldn't that be awesome to believe? Like, actually, for a second, take, your, take yourself out of the situation that you're in school. You're surrounded by all your friends, whether you like them or not. <laughs> take, them, take yourself out of that situation and say, if I actually believe that everything I read in this Bible pertained to me and also for the glory of God, how would that change your life? So that's what I began to do. I said, Lord, how do, you renew, how do I renew my hope? How do I keep my hope in you? And he brought me to Hebrews 11.1. 1. I keep messing with this thing. I'm sorry if that bothers you. He brought me to Hebrews 11.1 1, and it said, faith is. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. And Hebrews 11.6, one of the scariest verses in the Bible that I ever read says, it's impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. And I read that, I said, okay, then I need more faith because I want to please God. <laughs> Amen. And it said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Faith is only active if hope is active as well. You cannot have faith if you don't have a hope for who, for who God or what God will do. You can't have faith for who God is and what he can do right now. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Eleven times in the Gospels, Jesus said, If ask anything in my name, and if you do not doubt but believe, it will be done to you in accordance with your faith. Eleven times it's reiterated in different ways. And I said, God, I, I read these verses, and in this time of life, I hear who you are. I hear what you're saying. You're saying, if I ask, Lord, renew my strength, then you'll do it if I don't doubt. Lord, I ask if you'll heal my spiritual, spiritual health, my, my mental health. You'll, you'll heal these different things. And I wasn't like some people. I wasn't down. I wasn't like diagnosed, depressed, all this kind of stuff because the world loves to throw, throw around diagnosis. I wasn't in that situation, but I was going down that path, and I said, Lord, if you can renew my health, if you can renew who I am, you can reestablish my identity on your word, things will change. And he pointed me to that verse. He said, ask anything in my name, and if you do not doubt, it will be done according to you. And then the next thing that I felt the Holy Spirit say to me in that moment was, do you believe that I would do that? And I said, no. I, I don't, I, I mean, I believe it. Yeah, of course, I believe it. You're the God, you, you are who you say you are. I, I believe it, but I don't, know, I, I don't know if I can receive that. Like, I believe it, but will that actually happen? Would God care enough about me to heal me, to, to change things in my life, to take away the things that I've asked him for years or for a long period of time to change in my life? And he said, renew your hope. Isaiah 40, those who hope in the Lord. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. So I kept hoping in the Lord. I said, God, all right, I'm sitting in that chair. I've seen the people around me. Every time I come up to sing my senior year, I was on a praise team up here. And every time I come up to sing, I'd see the people that knew what happened in my life. And I'd look at their eyes and I'd see hypocrite. And I remember sitting up here and thinking to myself, Lord, I know who you are. And I want people to experience it. And I'm sorry that I failed. So help me. What do you want me to do? 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, if you confess your sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness is left if he's cleansed you from all of it? None. And so I asked him, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for what I did. Cleanse me from my unrighteousness. Renew my strength. Because right when I was sitting in that chair, Right when I was sitting in that chair and all these thoughts were going past, the other thought I had is, Lord, I want to be up on that stage someday preaching. Give me an opportunity, but I can only do that if you renew my strength. And so I kept going. High school ended. I had the most amazing three years in a row. It was an incredible time. My senior year was rough. <laughs> it was rough. We got a new football coach, which was awesome. And I remember going to college, and for the first time in my life, I'm like, okay, I get to start over. I get to start over. I'm going to a place 
that no one knows me called Dort University. Like one out of 15 people are from Unity there. But I went there and I said, Lord, this is where, this is where I'm starting over. And I began to read the word. And I began to read the word. So if you have your Bible, you can go to Matthew 13, but I'm going to read this for you. Matthew 13 is the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And honestly, one of the most interesting parts when I first read that was the last part, which said, he who has ears, let him hear, because I had no idea what I just read meant. <laughs> I was like, this is really great. You ever experienced that where you read the Bible and you're like, I, this is really good and I'm glad I'm doing a reading plan, but I have no idea what this means. In the same way that Jesus talked to everybody listening in that time and he said, he who has ears, let him hear. Those with eyes to see, let them see is the same way he's talking to you now. I'm a Christian, therefore I know God and I know the word. No. You're a Christian because Jesus died for you and you decided to confess with your mouth that you received him. You didn't get drafted into his army. You enlisted. To say you know God carries a connotation that you know who he is. It carries the weight along with it saying, no, God, I'm not going to be one of those people that you say to me, be gone from me. I never knew you. I'm going to be one of those people that you say, welcome my servant whom I love, my child, enter into the gates of my glory. And what is that transition there? It's between knowing who God is and just, you know, proclaiming because you're supposed to. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Verse 10. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. What did he mean by that? When you know Jesus, you understand what these words mean. When the seed, there's four different ways that the word can get into you. But there's only one way that it stays. I'm going to repeat those again. A sower went out to sow, and he sowed. Some seeds fell along the path, and the birds and came and devoured them. The first way is the word comes to you just like it did every single year, for, every two times a week for four years when I was in high school too. The word came, and there was no preparedness in my heart to receive the word of God. And it fell along the dry path. There was no fertile soil. There was nothing there. I didn't want to receive it. I didn't want to hear it. I, didn't, I, I wanted to sleep. I was tired. I didn't want to pay attention because it had nothing to do with me. I, there was a wall in my heart. And so when the word of God came, I wasn't prepared to receive it, and it fell along the path. And the, the worries, the things of life took them away. The second thing, other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no, they, no root, they withered away. This is where you receive the word. It's emotional high, right? You hear it, and you're like, oh, I believe in a God of miracles. I'm set free. I'm going this way. I'm going this way. I'm never turning back. This is awesome. I feel it. This is great. And then you wake up two, three days later, and suddenly you're right back to where you were. You went on a missions trip, one of those week-long things. You went to like a, a junior high youth retreat or something like that. And you listened and you're like, this is incredible. And then you came back and a week later, you're like, I am right back to where I was before I even left. Because it sprang up. The word was into you. It came into who you are. And then it sprung up. And then the worries, the things of life came back and it took it away because it wasn't deep enough. 
It wasn't revelation. It was knowledge. It was understanding. It was an experience. Those things are real. Those things are needed. But it wasn't revelation because the difference between knowledge and revelation, revelation is here and knowledge is here. It's the six inches that will trade you from heaven and hell. Knowledge and revelation. The word came. It sprung up. It was incredible. My life changed. And then the worries and things of life came, broke it all down, and everything, nothing was, everything was just like it was before I left. Have you experienced that? I've experienced that. It's like the word is real. It's talking about now. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain. Some a hundredfold, some sixteen, some thirty. These are the last two. One being, you heard the word, and you wanted to receive the word. You heard what was being said. You heard what the Lord was saying to you, but because there was so much going on around you, because of the people sitting next to you, because of the worries of life, because of your family, because of the way you were raised, because of the things, the places, the if and but and the other, because you could have had as good of soil, you could have been as prepared as you wanted to be to hear what the Lord had to say to you today, but because of all the other things around you, it just it died out and nothing took root. Because, because why would he do it to me? Or I wouldn't stand for him when he would stand for me because of the people around me. Because that would actually take me standing and doing something. Those were three of the four. Three of the four things that can happen when the word goes out. And trust me, I get it. Three of those four things happened for multiple years of my life when I sat in these chairs. I'd hear the word just like you guys do. Two times a week, every week. And most of the time, it didn't find its fruitful soil. And then the last one, I'll repeat it. But then other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And now I'm going to take you all the way back to the place where I was sitting, right where my friend in the white sweatshirt is. And I, three years in a row, I had the time of my life. It was incredible. I was like, I'm going from glory to glory. Hallelujah. I'm helping people. I'm serving people. But then I found myself sitting in that place my senior year thinking to myself, my entire life is different now. No matter if people know or not, like I said before, I know and it's changing my life. I can't be who I'm called to be. Lord, renew my strength. Those who hope. In the Lord. So I said, All right, God, you're asking me to hope and my strength will be renewed. And if I have hope, then I can have faith for anything. So, Lord, let me hope for something. Lord, I hope that you will change my life around. And as long as I hope for that, I'm going to live into expectancy for it. And I started to read the Word of God. And I started to see what he was doing when I was in college. And I started to believe in the God of miracles. I started to believe in the God that was famous for all the stories I heard my entire life. That was famous for what he did for other people. And I started to believe, God, this word is true. It's alive and active. So I can believe it for myself. I can believe it. I can read this and know I don't have to settle for what the devil has for me. I don't have to settle to just be continually beaten by the devil in this world. You said that he's the the king of this world, but when you died on the cross and you rose again, you took back the authority the devil stole, and you gave it back to the Holy Spirit-filled believer. And if that's true, then what that means is even though suffering may produce perseverance, that the God, the same spirit, the Bible says, that rose Jesus Christ from the dead, lives in you. And if that is true, then how does that change how you live? The same spirit that healed the blind man, that opened deaf ears, that healed the leper, that set people free, that delivered people from demons, the same spirit lives in you. How does that change things? Suddenly, that victim mentality that this world is so keen on having starts to fade away. And my experience no longer, when I would reflect on these things, my experience stopped trumping the word of God. And I read the word and I said, all right, God, okay, you tell me to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, then I'm going to go to Western. (laughs) 
because I got invited there first. I'm going to go to Western, and I'm going to preach, and I'm going to preach your word, and you're going to confirm it just like you did with the disciples, with the apostles, with everyone, the church of old, that with your church, what you still to do, just like you do every time and you say in your word, that you'll confirm your word when it goes out with signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm going to go do that. And so I went to Western, and I preached, and in my opinion, it was a fire sermon. It was a fire talk. I just let it rip. I was yelling. It was great. I was spitting everywhere. It was awesome. I was baptizing people with my saliva in the front row. It was a good time. And we got done. <laughs> you guys are laughing. And we went to a prayer room, and I had one of the ladies follow me. Um, our whole team was there. Um, I had one of the girls follow me, and we had a whole bunch of people in this area. And everyone started receiving prayer for the things that they were going through, for the things that they had going on in their life. And I had this one girl pull me aside. And I'm telling you this because it's at Western. I had her, she pulled me aside and she said, Cade, I'm attacked by demons every single night. So don't hear what I didn't say, all of you. So Western people are demon possessed. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, I agree with that. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> she looked at me and she said, Cade, and this wasn't like a weird person. There's weird people out there. <laughs> There's weird people out there, but this wasn't a weird person. This person was probably considered very popular at Western. And she came up to me, she said, Kate, I'm attacked by demons every single night. And I don't know what to do because it's the most real thing I've ever experienced and I don't know who to talk to about it because no one believes me. And I don't even know what to do because I don't know how to read the word. I don't, I don't know what's going on. All I know is that Jesus died for me and I, I don't know what to do because every single night I'm laying on my bed and I start to get choked, I start to get attacked, I get all these things. And that might be scary, but that's very real. And so I looked at her and I said, what does the word say? Ephesians 6 says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the spiritual beings, against the heavenly beings of this world. Everything you face in your day, even, the wor even if the world wants to call it one thing, isn't actually just natural. I'll be the first to say it. If you've been diagnosed with depression, anxiety, ADHD, you've gotten a bad report from the doctor from your, your physical health. Maybe you tore your ACL or your MCL. Or you're getting older and so your body is just deteriorating and that's what the world says. Every single battle you face is not of flesh and blood, but against the powers at work, the spiritual, the ascending, it says, and descending powers of the spiritual realm. And I told her that, and I said, what follows up Ephesians 6 when I say that right there? The armor of God. And I told her, Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God rose from the dead for the forgiveness of your sins, you will be saved. I said, have you ever, I know you're going to a Christian school, I know that, but have you ever confessed Jesus as your Lord? Like you yourself said, Jesus is my Lord. And she looked at me and she said, no, no, I mean, I've, I've had situations where I felt like it was just time to do that. You know, I worship, I do things like that. But I had never, and this is her talking, I had never actually given my life to the Lord. And so I led her through a prayer. And she gave her life to the Lord. And then I prayed for her. And then all of a sudden, it was like, I, this is so hard to explain. In that room we were in, the prayer room, it was like the Holy Spirit filled the whole room and there was joy and there was freedom. A week later, on Thursday, I came back to her and she said, because that was on a Tuesday, it was a Thursday. I came back to her and she, the biggest smile ever, and she goes, the things I didn't tell you is that I was addicted to alcohol. I was addicted to pain medication." I was addicted to all these different things. I had a demon attacking me every single night. I had all these things. I, I, I have a Christian family. I have Christian friends. I have all these things. I have all this stuff going on. But the moment you prayed for me, the moment you and your team, everybody laid hands on me, I was set free and I never struggled with, I haven't, I haven't struggled with it again. And she started coming to our discipleship program. And for months, her entire life was completely changed to this day. That's at Western. <laughs> yeah. 
And I, I, I used to think, you know what, uni unity's not like that. You know, I used to be right there, and I said, unity doesn't, doesn't struggle like that. But I know that there are people here that have had spiritual experiences that they don't know how to explain. That have had real-life experiences that the doctors continue to say that they'll struggle with their whole life. And I want you to know that that story was the beginning of an entire series of events where this word, the revelation of one verse in this word, changed the course of my life, and it will do the same for you. It will change the course of your life. Remember, when the word goes out, it's your job to prepare the soil. That's why Jesus said, if you have ears to hear, let hear me. If you have eyes to see, see me. It's your job. You have to fight Otherwise, the devil will have a three-fourths of a chance to take away what the Word of God wants to do in you. It'll change your life. So I know the bell just rang. So I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to stand up again, actually. <clears throat> Don't worry, I'll let you go soon. I want you to close your eyes. And I just want you to think for a moment, Lord, if I believed your Word, if I believed that the Bible was true, what would I want to change in my life right now? What would I ask you to change in my life right now? Just think about that. Every single person has something. It doesn't have to be dramatic either. Think about it. Get something. Now this is what I'll send you off with. I want you to go home and I want you to find five, five verses that you can repeat to yourself every single day that will build your faith to receive what you just asked God of. But while your eyes are closed, I'm just going to pray over you right now. Lord, I thank you that you are a good God. I thank you that you have a plan for every student in here. You have a plan for every child of God in here. And Lord, if you created the, day, if you created the world in six days, it wouldn't take longer than an hour to change our life to change every single thing that happens in our life in accordance with your word. So Jesus, right now, I thank you, God, that you're beginning a new work in your children. You're beginning a new thing in your children. Lord, that they don't have to settle for what things, how things have always been, but they can open their word, and the same thing that you did for one person, they can expect to happen in and through them. We worship you, Jesus. And right now, with every eye closed, if the Lord gave you something directly that you have faith for, I want you to just raise your hand. That he gave you something directly to start praying into. Just raise your hand up in the air with every eye closed. Don't worry, I'm not going to call on you. I won't make things weird. He's going to do something in this next, before Christmas, I'll tell you right now. He's going to do something in your life that will undoubtedly answer that prayer. And it's going to be one of the most incredible things you've ever experienced. In Jesus' name. You may put your hand down. So now, I know I'm supposed to let you go, but I want to extend this invitation because normally I have about three to four hours to preach and then lay hands on everybody. But you may be dismissed if you would like prayer for any of those things. I would love to pray for you. It'll be a fun time. I'll see you guys again sometime. Have a great year. It's an incredible opportunity that you guys are doing groundbreaking tomorrow. I'll see you guys later. Thank you for having me. This was awesome.